Okay. Let me just get some sound up here. Okay, that's better. So how many of you folks here are dive um, operators, in other words, running a dive operation or a dive pro that takes people out on diving excursions? How many of you? A, a couple. As Dr. Um, Sarayva said in the last talk, one of the most important things that we need to do, that you need to do in order to help us to help you when something goes wrong, is to think through what are the things that can go wrong in your business and your operation and to be prepared for that. <clears throat> now I have done this talk once before in a completely different version and since then based on your feedback I've actually put together a fillable PDF form that can actually guide you through the process of putting together your own emergency action plan and when it's done you print it out and then you have a plan for the various emergencies that you might find yourselves in. But what I'd like to do before I get to actually filling the form in is to explain to you some of the thinking behind um, what emergencies can happen and how we can be best prepared to deal with them. So really the first question is, and you know, some of you might say to me, you guys overreact to stuff, but remember we're the ones that pick up once something goes wrong. So many, many dive operations take place without any incident. And the problem we have then, is Dan, is how to deal with it when your emergency action plan is phone Dan. And the first thing we're going to ask you is, what is your emergency action plan? Are we going to get those two things to line up? Accidents do happen. They're not that frequent. They could be you know, minor in severity. They could be fatal. And we need to look at this before we have an incident that happens on your watch. So we know we have issues. And there's a picture of a rebreather that burnt out about two years ago in, in Tulum. Pretty a um, lot of burn um, injury to the, to the dive the dive himself, it was his rebreather, and I think he was partly devastated that his equipment was no longer functional. But what you really want to do is to have an effective response so that you don't go and do the wrong thing. And when it is time critical, that's when we tend to get confused. And unless we have this plan thought out well before the time, what's going to happen is we're going to panic and we probably end up doing the wrong stuff and ending up in an even worse situation. And then from the dive operator's point of view or the dive professional, if something goes wrong with your excursion, you know that certainly in this country the first question is going to be who's going to sue who. Whether you've got liability insurance or not, this is probably one of the biggest risks that you face once the incident has passed. So the trick is to be prepared. The trick is to understand what are the types of emergencies that you can have in your operation. It's going to vary tremendously depending on the site, depending on where you are located. And you want to then obviously have some way of knowing in advance how you're going to respond, have the right equipment, the right training of the people around you, and obviously the right resources that you can reach out for. And in addressing you, for those of you that operate in remote areas, it's all very well to have a standard emergency action plan that you copy from someone else. But the services in the area where you are might be completely inappropriate to deal with the type of incident we have in diving. And we get this, it's really one of the tough things for Dan to deal with. When we know what we need to do, but those services are not available, and so we have to come up with our own plan B. Okay, so let's go back one step and look at this kind of from a business planning point of view. Clearly in your business, you want to protect your staff. Your staff are your front line, and if they're the ones that get injured, then that's going to cascade down, obviously, onto your clients. So you want to protect your clients. Having a good emergency action plan cannot always stop the incident from happening, but it can certainly mitigate the amount of damage that is then caused. Thirdly, we need to protect the public. If we have a cylinder explosion, some form of a fire, other people could be injured, not just our clients and our staff. And clearly, we want to protect the community. We, you know, in some of the smalling dive areas, most of the tourism relies very heavily on the diving, and if we have a dive operator out of business, that means local tourism suffers too. Then we want to protect the environment, so we don't have spills and things that then have you know, cascading impact on the environment. And you need to protect your assets. So whether it's a boat that has a fire on it, or whether it's a compressor and a series of cylinders that explode in your filling station, at the same time you know, as dealing with the emergency, you don't want to lose your equipment. And let's be as pragmatic as we can. You want to try and do the best you can to prevent that liability suit from really becoming um, something that causes almost more damage. Now, we can't prevent things from going wrong every single time. But if you can show that you've taken 
the best you could, you've done the best you could have done, prepared for it before the time, then your chance of getting out of that liability suit is going to be much, much larger than if you put your hands up in the air and say, well, I couldn't help this happening, and you know what happens. The lawyers then blame you for everything, and either you or your insurance company are going to end up carrying the can for that. And you might be insured, but insurance doesn't take off your conscience the fact that somebody got injured or even worse, got killed on your, in your particular dive business. So insurance is only part of the picture. The consequential damage can be even more so. And then ultimately, you want to retain your clients. And if you have an emergency and you deal with it properly, other clients are going to see you knew what you were doing. They're going to feel safer diving with you, and you'll end up not losing those clients. Other times we see a complete disaster, the dive operator pointed their finger in every other direction and clearly not somebody that people want to go diving with. So let's have a look now at a couple of the areas in your dive operation, your dive business, in your area that you're diving in that present these sorts of injuries to you. So what we're going to do now is what we call a risk assessment. We're going to try and understand what are the things that can go wrong and how important are they and how much could they affect your business, because that would then affect the priorities that you place. So you might have several different types of emergencies, but some of them are time critical, that really require a very dedicated plan, and other ones are less so, and you can have a checklist and various ways of dealing with that. So it requires you to walk through your operation, not just the physical buildings and the workshops or the boat, but actually thinking about what clients could go through. Um, what could happen to your staff when they're out on the boat or out on the excursion. And then we go through the typical three steps of what we call a risk assessment. And that is determining how likely is it that you, something could go wrong. And we usually score this on a, on a scale of one to five. It's a totally separate lecture. But we can come out with a score, a number, which makes it so much easier when we're discussing it amongst ourselves to agree that we have an issue or we don't have an issue. And you know, many times people will see something that is potentially hazardous, and when we do the risk assessment, we realize actually it's not a big issue. Other times, some of us play it down, but when you do your risk assessment, you realize it is actually something that you need to deal with. The second part of this is you must have an exposure. If you're not going to expose somebody or some equipment to a hazard, then you don't have a risk. This is one of the areas where we can actually say, hang on, you know, this is potentially a big issue, but we're not dealing with that. And therefore, we can't have an exposure to that particular hazard. And then lastly, what are the consequences of an incident happening? So that can go from mild, you know, something that disrupts your, your dive operation, right up to fatal or catastrophic. And again, these three things together are going to define what your risk is, and then give you a magnitude, a series of how important is it for me to actually address that. And then lastly, on this particular topic, we divide our emergencies up really into two categories. I mean, you can put them into as many as you'd like to. The one is going to be medical. So this is typically what we set ourselves up for in a dive business. Trauma, decompression sickness, anything of a medical nature. Health issues these days is really the big issue. And then what are the technical and operational issues? And just by dividing that into two should help you to see where you have potential areas that could go wrong. So let's just, I've got a couple of um, pointers here to give you some ideas as to where these things could lie. And it really depends on your scope of operation. So you're going to look at what you actually do and define what are the risks and what you actually do and not what the theory is. So in the dive center, if we have a dive center, if we're filling cylinders, if we're using chemicals to do chemical cleaning, um, if we have any electricity around, yes, believe it or not, we do electrocute people. It happens from time to time, often because of stupidity. But I'll probably say this again during this presentation. If you identify your risks up front, then it's far less likely that you're going to have an accident because you're aware of it. If you don't do this form of risk assessment, you're not aware of the things that could go wrong, that's where they tend to go wrong. And then contaminated gas, for those of you that can attend the talk that Dr. Nochet and I are going to do day after tomorrow, I think, you'll see a couple of examples of where we've had contaminated gas, and we have to try and unravel where that came from. Not obvious, you can't see gas, you can't taste it, you can't smell it in most cases. So contamination is a big issue for us. And then giving the person the wrong gas. And you might think that's weird, and I'm not going to mention any names, 
but we do um, kind of site training on air quality testing to help people understand what goes into and what can affect the air quality. And they gave me an air cylinder and I was m measuring it and I see the O2 level is about 31.5%. But this is diving air, this is not nitrox. And what had happened is that filling station had filled that entire batch of air cylinders with nitrox with no way of knowing it. And as air divers, we don't bother to check the O2. We only check the O2 if we are nitrox divers. Completely unknown, you don't know what's inside that cylinder. So it does happen. And the trick is, if you pick it up, then how do you deal with that? Then for those of you that are training, using obviously confined waters or your training area, depends where you are, um, obviously we have the same range of injuries, trauma, people slipping, the same health issues that people have, um, and obviously drowning we know is one of those sad issues that happens. Just add on to that if you're using a pool that you could have chemical exposure to. So somebody's not dosing the water correctly and you can end up with um, chemical reaction in the water and then obviously spills and other forms of, uh, of injuries, mostly in our staff that are dealing with chlorine and various other toxic substances. Okay, so let's now have a look at when we go diving. This is maybe a little bit more familiar to us, and many of, of the dive operators and professionals tend to get lost just looking at what could happen when you go out to the site or out on the boat. Most common of these is trauma, people dropping things on themselves or other forms of injuries like getting their fingers caught in the ladders when they're getting out of the boat. And we know when it gets rough and we have these ladders that move up and down, very easy to end up with a guillotine chopping somebody's finger off. Again, health issues, our population, our diving population isn't getting any younger and people out of shape is not that uncommon anymore. So we find a lot of things that look like they're diving related are really related to people's general health. And there are ways of picking that up before the time and that's really what one would want to focus on. Decompression illness, only one of many different topics that I'm raising here. Drowning, so you have a drowning on board and the person's now not there anymore. <coughs> How do you deal with that? I mean, hopefully you can call somebody to tell you, but you need to show other people on the boat how you actually going to deal with that. Lost diver, another one of our big fears, another one of those emergency action plans that you have to have. And if you're on a boat and you don't have a lost diver program, you are going to be in such trouble from the Coast Guard and other authorities um, if it comes down to that, if you don't find them. And we lose divers. Don't ask me why we're not attentive enough to these things. There are many devices people can use these days, and yet in areas where there's a lot of current and, and um, rough water, we, it happens. And then lastly, hazardous marine life injuries, another one of those. You know, we like to play with the sharks and hang around them, and every now and again they are not so happy with us. So outside of that, we have boats and motor vehicles. And we take our clients down to the dive site. Sometimes it's a long way from where the dive shop is to where the site is. Remember that when they're in your vehicle, they are your responsibility, and you need to have some emergency action plan if you get a breakdown, if you have an accident. And then on boats, I think there's a fairly well-established range of issues that you could face, and it doesn't really matter whether it's you driving the boat or you owning the boat or you chartering from someone else. You need to make sure that they then have a plan in place. Again, the Coast Guard has a requirement, I think there's three absolute requirements that they have, man overboard, fire, and I think when the boat goes down. If you don't have those three plans in place, drilled and a record kept of that, then you get in violation of Coast Guard regulations and they can hold you totally accountable for that. Okay, then let's think a little bit further outside of just diving and especially where we're in a remote area where things are a little bit um, outside of our control. So we have fires. Any of you here from the California, Oregon area? We know that we have fires over there. Not only from the fire itself, but obviously from the pollution contamination in the air. And that's a topic we will address in another presentation because it's really interesting hearing what the concerns are and then analyzing what can happen. Obviously marine life, especially if there are um, fire coral and various other things underwater that can, can affect people, we need to know about it before the time. And if it does turn to an injury, we now need to know how to deal with it. Same with toxic water, um, some of the currents that you get, the red tides, we need to be prepared for that. Weather clearly is a big issue for us. If we're going out somewhere far away from land, then we need to know how we're going to deal with a, with a weather issue. We had a, a, um, a case in the country where I'm from, 
anybody apart from those of you who know me would know where I'm from. Where's this accent from? Any guesses? Don't say Australia, please. <laughs> Paraguay. I'm from South Africa. And we had a white shark excursion. Um, they went out again see the, to bug the poor white sharks. And they had a weather incident. The weather turned really bad. And the skipper called back to shore and said, listen, I'm turning around. We're coming back because it's not safe. And the operations center on shore said, no, you're not. You're going to stay there and finish the dive. These guys have paid $1,000 each. You'll finish the dive. Who has the right, the decision to decide to turn back or not? The operations center or the skipper? Who pays the salary? The guy's desperate for a job. So the skipper does what he shouldn't have done because he should have bought the, ba bo bought the boat back. The boat capsized and a very successful lawsuit against the skipper and the dive operator for trying to override. He clearly should have come back. And you want to get rid of that strife. You want to have a plan in place that says, if this happens, this is what we're doing, no arguments. You don't want to argue at the time. And then some of the areas where we go diving, and I'll, I'll just throw one example out because I know, happen to know what's happened in Zanzibar. Every now and again, there is some issue. Roadblocks everywhere, clients that go diving get held up at the roadblock, they say the wrong thing and it turns into a real problem. And then sometimes just social strife. And again, some of the areas, the remote areas we dive in, not so much around here in the Caribbean, but certainly out towards Indonesia, Philippines and those places, we just need to have a plan and brief our clients before the time that they uh, don't end up in a situation that could be pretty tough to deal with. And then coupled to that, travel issues, I mean, some of these are not life or death things, but you want to have a plan if a client comes in and he gets his stuff seized at customs, or immigration won't let him in, or he's got something in his passport they don't like, and they then detain him or her. Clients that get lost, go walking in the evenings from the dive center. I think most of us have dealt with this before, right? We go walking in a strange village and we don't remember how to get back again. And then some of the behavioral things where clients get arrested or clients end up in a fight or there's aggression or some other issue, how are we going to deal with that? And let me just add on to that. How do you deal with a client misbehaving on the boat? Big client, small dive operator, how do you deal with that person with their aggressive behavior? And we've heard the stories. But you need to have a plan before the time. And hopefully the plan is not grab a gun and shoot the guy. But there needs to be a well thought through way of dealing with that conflict situation. Because at the time it happens, you're going to feel really uncomfortable and you know you have no idea how to deal with that. Okay. Sorry, my clock is just bleating at me. There we go. So next part of this is figuring out how we're going to respond and what sort of emergency equipment do we need to have. What you want to do, the very first thing you want to do is try to prevent the situation getting worse, getting out of control. And the words that we use are, you know, contain, control, extinguish, um, isolate the area. It depends what the emergency is. So if it's a chemical spill in the chemical room, clearly you want to close the door and then take emergency action. If it's a fire, sometimes you have to then evacuate the area. So you'll need to think through what can go wrong. I have an explosion in my filling station. I've got cylinders that are going pop, pop. It's happened. We get these things four or five a year that we get to hear about, never mind how many are out there that we don't get to hear about because there's a lawsuit involved. So you want to mitigate, you want to try to prevent that situation from getting worse. Now, we can debate here amongst ourselves which way around to do this. Contain, communicate, or deal with the injured people. I'm going to give it to you in my language. You're free to disagree and do it the way around you'd like to do it. So you might want to scream for help first. My point of view is stop the thing from getting worse, otherwise calling for help, getting people out the way is not going to stop this thing from going out of control. So, communicate. Do you have the means of communicating and are the numbers that you have appropriate and are the services that you're calling able to actually assist you in this particular emergency? So, in some of the areas you call the fire brigade and they're going to take 45 minutes to get to you and by then it's way too late, so you need to have a plan to deal with it in the meantime. And then the third part is stabilizing the person, getting them out of harm's way and doing the best you can to stabilize them before they then get taken to the next level of care. 
And my point of view is that in that order, we're going to prevent things from really getting out of control. Other people will do differently, and it's, you know, it's not a right or wrong issue. You prepare yourself this before the time, and you follow your plan. That's what is going to be your primary defense if you call to account afterwards. Not what your plan had, but did you have a plan, and did you follow your plan? Okay, and then to do this, you're going to obviously need trained personnel. So we need first aid training. We need to have people that can perhaps deal with fires. I mean, so we'll have a, a dive centre in a fairly remote area. We've got extinguishers, right? So we're ready. Have you ever put a fire out before? Do you know how to put a fire out, or are you going to end up spreading that fire? So in that case, you'd need some actual firefighting training um, that's going to help you, that, you know, when things go wrong. Then do you have rescue divers on board, especially if you're going diving in challenging, demanding waters? And just as important is who's going to assist you when you're dealing with this emergency. So it's going to be pointless having only one person that's trained to deal with this, and that person is totally focused on containing the, the emergency. And then lastly, your emergency equipment. So we're pretty much used to having a first aid kit on board. I'd like to say that every dive operator has emergency auction on board. That is actually very sadly not the case in some of the more remote areas. They don't even have an idea what that means. If you do have emergency auction on board, I'm sorry the screen is not very... Uh, this presents great if you do Zoom because you can then um, focus in on there. But what I have there is a table to remind you that you need to consider how far it is from where you might have an injury to the next level of care. And that's usually measured in less than an hour on some of these small cylinders. So please, having an O2 kit with a you know, nine cubic foot oxygen cylinder is not going to help you if you're an hour or two away from the next level of care or where you can get more oxygen. So it requires planning. And if you then have two masks and one cylinder, remember you're then going to halve the time that you have. So that's on our website. It's just a really useful tool to use in your reckoning. Obviously, you need to have communications equipment, and sometimes you'll have, if you're out at sea, you'll need a radio. Sometimes cell phones work, sometimes they don't. You need a backup radio. So please don't just take the bare minimum. Always think, what is plan B if plan A doesn't work? And usually, you know, people tell me they rely on their cell phones, then the water gets rough, it cannot pick up the signal from the land, and you have no plan B. Not allowed if you have a boat that is in any of these maritime jurisdictions. And then something we learned from the, really the miserable fire that we had on board a boat um, here in the US, and it's happened elsewhere, is that when people get trapped below deck, sure, we have an evacuation plan. Sometimes it doesn't work as it should. But there's a great case to be made from fire and smoke hoods, because those will allow people that are below the deck at least another 15 to 20 minutes to get out. The biggest killer in these cases is the carbon monoxide that debilitates people so that they get stuck and you know, you're not going to send somebody down there to rescue them. So a couple of ideas for you there that you can think about. Right, I said it before. Calling for help is not your emergency action plan. That's one step of at least three steps that you need to take. And when you do call, what are you going to get? You might think you're going to get the full suite of services, but that's not always how it works. And then when you call these people, do they know what a diving emergency is? Are they actually able to assist you? And if the answer is no, then you need to have that ability to deal with the injured diver. So very important to know what's available in your area where you're diving, how long it'll take to get somebody to you. Most of us are spoilt in the, in the US, 911 and everything happens. <laughs> doesn't happen elsewhere. And it doesn't happen if that particular service provider is out of service, and somebody asked the question before about recompression chambers, they do go out of service. Fortunately, some of them that we deal with that are right up at the top of our list, green, will actually advise us in advance. We're down for maintenance, we're down for staffing issues, we're down for COVID, and we know then to refer that, those injured people to some other facility. But that doesn't help um, in some areas where we don't have that, that relationship. Then it's important to understand what the insurance company can actually do. And, uh, Dr. Sariva spoke before about what Dan can do and what the people that we rely on to deal with um, in terms of emergency evacuations and so on. But the important thing to know is that insurance companies don't own hospitals, they don't own EMS services, they don't own helicopters and fixed-wing aircraft. 
they rely on other people to do that. So they might have a facilitated facilitate or dispatch or, dispatch or some organizing ability, but they're going to rely on other people to bring in. So if you have diving insurance or for your business or for the divers, and you're located in an area where there is no hospital, no chamber, no evacuation equipment, then that's something you need to deal with. And it's all very well to say, I couldn't, you know, there's nothing I could do. You take people to an area of risk, you are responsible for them. You might need to inform them before the time. You might have to tell them it's going to take us eight hours to get you to help. Um, that's just the way it is. We don't fly helicopters out to sea to some of these places. So there needs to be a plan B in place for that. And yes, there is no day in helicopter. So although we do our very best to help you, we don't actually own the equipment. We rely on these service providers, chambers, fixed wing aircraft, whatever, whatever it happens to be. Remember, and again, Camilo said that, you know, if you don't have specific insurance, and I'm not pushing now for Dan, I'm saying any form of travel insurance, any form of dive insurance, if you don't have it, or if you have one that works on reimbursement only, so remember credit card companies mostly work on reimbursement. Spend the money, and then they will pay, pay you back afterwards. You try and get a $50,000 evacuation on your credit card. It's not going to work very easily. And if you might say to me, in the US they have to do that, maybe. But in Indonesia they don't. In Indonesia they're not waiting for you to get back to the States to send them a check for that. And so a lot of service providers outside of here are going to require a guarantee of payment. They're going to say, before you, we take you in for hyperbaric treatment, we need a $25,000 guarantee of payment. Now, the insurance company should issue that for you, but you need to check that they're actually going to do that for you. And then just lastly, before we get into the how do we put this plan together, please be aware that things change and gaps develop in our plans. Things don't always stay static. So before you go on your, on your endeavor, on your excursion, make sure that whatever's changed in terms of egress um, and getting out of the water, that you can deal with it. If weather changes, how are you going to actually manage that? These are things that are dynamic, so it's going to vary from situation to situation. Make sure that you are in touch with the local emergency providers, that they are able to get to where you need to get them to. So again, if you're going into an area that is outside of the range of some of these EMS people, that you know what their limited range or their range limitation is. And then contact numbers. So we go get the contact numbers and we make sure that everything's populated in our emergency action plan and then they change. Yeah, we have 911. Other countries don't have 911. They, you have to physically go and find those numbers and then please, you must check them every six months to every year, pick up the number, do a drill, make sure that the people are still there. Happens with chambers all the time. So you have the, the name and the number for the local chamber and when you need it, it's out of service, the number doesn't work. Very often in remote areas, what you will get when you call the chamber is the doctor or the technician's cell number. So if they moved on, you've lost contact with that particular facility. Obviously, make sure that you've got adequate operating procedures for that area. Things change, we change the way we dive, so we need to make sure that our standard operating procedures stay in line with what we're doing. A good standard operating procedure that takes emergencies into account is going to make sure that the chance of an incident or an accident is greatly reduced. And of course, make sure that you brief people, your staff as well as the clients, especially when we're doing something somewhat out of the ordinary. And we want to go to cool places and dive, you know, in caves and other sort of areas. We just need to be very, very well aware of what are the things that can go wrong. And then things like where to evacuate people to, where's the muster point? You know, on some of these boat fires, it's every man for themselves and everybody jumps overboard and then you have no idea where your clients are, where your staff are. Are they still on the boat? Are they in the water? And that leads to a huge amount of panic. So you want to tell people, if we have this issue, I want you all to congregate over there and then you know that everybody's accounted for. Or if not, then you can let the emergency services know we've got two or three people unaccounted for. And any firefighters over here, and I know there's one, at least one at the back, you might watch the movies. You might have seen James Bond and other superheroes put a towel over their heads and dash back into the building to fetch somebody that's trapped, the damsel in distress, the pet in distress. You don't do that. Never. Once you're at the building, you do not go back in the building. You let the firefighters go into the building. Otherwise, 
If you go back, then that firefighter or rescue person has two people to rescue, and you're putting their lives in danger. Unless you're a firefighter with all the equipment, you never go back into a burning boat or a burning building. And then obviously make sure that people are prepared, they're trained, they're competent, and they're confident that if there is an emergency, they can follow what they're meant to follow. Of course, that's going to lead us to making sure that we drill these things, so we practice them. We don't just put them together and forget about them. And then after everything has happened, we need to take stock of the situation. We need to fill in our documentation. I know that when things go really wrong, you're hoping somehow that people won't know what went wrong. So if it doesn't exist in writing, it doesn't exist, you are dead wrong. You've made yourself absolutely vulnerable to even the most amateur claimant's attorney. He, the your defense attorney can defend you based on what you did. And they can explain whether you did or didn't do that particular action correctly or not correctly. But if you have nothing, they can blame you for everything, including being completely unprepared, and that way you are truly vulnerable to any form of lawsuit. And then lastly, please remember, if you've ever had to use your first aid kit or your emergency oxygen, don't just pack it up and put it there ready for the next time. Make sure that it gets refilled, it gets serviced correctly. Dr. Nochet and I have been out to places where they've got a great set of O2 kits and you open it up, and it's corroded, the masks have rotted, there's no gas inside there. People are so used to taking their green kit out on their boat and not that used to realizing that every couple of years it needs to be thoroughly maintained. Okay, so a plan is great in theory, but you need to make sure that that plan works and that you train everybody to the plan and that if they do have an emergency, they're going to be able to respond competently without having to kind of second guess uh, what comes next. So, first thing to do in once we, we've trained and put this thing in place is to see does it work. And I don't have any particular examples I can give to you now in terms of the diving, but from the hyperbaric side of it where we have done a fair amount of work in safety inside hospitals with chambers, they have an evacuation plan from the hyperbaric room to outside, and they have an emergency exit. And they don't practice the emergency plan. And then one day they decide they need to practice it, and as they try to get that stretch out of the building, they can no longer get down the corridor because there's new furniture there. So things will change, and if you don't practice your plan often enough, you're not gonna pick up those changes, and when you rely on fetching that extinguisher that used to be there, it's now been moved, and you didn't know that, then you're stuck. So at this stage, you probably want to reevaluate every now and again, make sure that the plan is making sense. And then train that plan. And when I say train that plan, I don't mean sitting around the table talking about what, thing, what can go wrong. I mean actually get out there. Have your peers watch you. Have a stopwatch. Put as much pressure as you can on people because that's the only way they're going to respond appropriately. And when we do these exercises, we get shy. We get kind of embarrassed. Everybody's watching me. And what if I mess up? We'd rather you messed up doing the drill then you mess up during the actual emergency. So as much as it might be uncomfortable, drills need to be realistic. And then stick with the plan. Uh, drill regularly, people say to me, you know, how often should you drill the plan? And the answer to that question is change of staff, complexity of the plan, the criticality of the plan will determine how often you need to practice that. And if it's really complicated, every three months you need to do the plan. Anybody here been on a, a cruise ship before? We, you know, when the passengers go on, they have this really stupid lifeboat drill where everybody's talking and laughing and whatever, put their preserver and walk to the nearest station. But watch the crew. Before every cruise, that crew is meant to practice their man overboard, um, abandoned ship drills so that they are ready for it. It's complicated on a big boat. You can't just assume if you've done it once before that nothing's changed, that it'll work as you thought it would do that before. And as an operator, when you've got your staff at the point where you feel comfortable that they know what they're doing, you will be far more comfortable that you're unlikely to have that situation occur. So again, if we're aware of what can go wrong, less likely that we're going to let these things happen. It's because we become complacent. You know, we look at something, we assess what the risks are, we say, gosh, this is really serious. And let me give you an example. Filling a scuba cylinder. The first time we do that, we're pretty careful, aren't we? Make sure the hoses are in place, that you know, everything is correctly coupled up. Carefully open the valve, fill the cylinder. The, time, the third or fourth day of doing that, are you as afraid of what's happening in that cylinder 
no. And the more and more time goes past, the more complacent we, we become. But that risk, that risk never changed from day one until the end of time. It's always been there. And here's a, a scary thought for you. A scuba cylinder filled with gas has the same amount of energy as a five-ton truck on a highway traveling at 70 miles an hour. If we were to rupture that cylinder instantaneously, that's how much energy is inside there. So scuba divers, all of us, walk around with our cylinders you know, pretty nonchalantly, not really worrying about what could go wrong. They are over-designed. They are properly inspected. The chance of you getting a rupture is relatively uncommon except we still have aluminum cylinders out there that have got those flaws from 30 years back, and we have these accidents happen you know, several times a year. Okay, so let me go through this um, fillable PDF form that we put together, and it's free on our website. You just need to go to the dan.org, go to safety services, go down to dive operators and professionals, look at the resources. It's there, free for you to download and to change it in any way you want to. The idea is to give you something to help guide you in a direction to put a plan together and when you're done print it out and you should have a really effective plan it's forced you to think of what needs to be done and remember when you're putting emergency action plans together it's not just one person sitting there and thinking what could go wrong it's the whole team of you because when you sit together with it as a team people start to do the what if but that's not going to work and what if this happens and that's how we put a good plan together with all the different permutations that could actually happen. So that's what the form looks like. When you download it, it's got a couple of pages of, of instructions, which is what I'm going to go through now. But that's really what we're going to fill in. All those blue things are areas where we can either select something or we can type additional text into. And I'm going to go through one with you as I get to the end of the presentation to show you how the process works. Okay, so we talk of accidents and incidents, right? And near misses, which is even more important to, to monitor those than accidents and incidents. And the difference between an incident and an accident is simply when it becomes irreversible. When there's damage that is caused, when something goes wrong, it moves from an incident to an accident. So knocking a cylinder over, no one got hurt, that's an incident, it's a near miss, no one got hurt, so there's no accident involved. Falling on someone's foot, that incident now becomes an accident. Okay. The next thing then to do is to select what type of emergency it is. And we've put in there two drop-down boxes. So if it's in a medical event, you can click on the drop-down and it'll give you the, basically the medical emergencies that we've seen occur. But we obviously haven't seen everything, so you might need to put something else in there. And most of these drop-downs have got an area where it's called other text and you type in there the name of that particular event that you're concerned about. And the same with non-medical events there, the list is a lot longer, so you've got a slider bar to go and select uh, which of those could occur. And that's gonna be the basis of your emergency action plan. But I've already forced you to think. So when you take the form, you look at the drop-downs, you can say to yourself, this can happen to me, this can't happen to me, and then you'll focus on the areas that are important. Right, so we talk about emergency action plan, and what do we mean by an emergency? Okay, so we have a couple of definitions for you to think about. Essentially, an emergency is something where we lose control, where we cannot contain something where if we don't react, it's going to lead to more damage. And an emergency is also, but not only, where time is critical. So the more critical time is, the more we need to have a sound plan that is drilled and people know what to do. Okay, so we decide, it's our first step, once we've decided what the emergency is. Is it an emergency? If it is, then we're going to follow down the chart. If you're not sure whether it's an emergency, then you deal with it as if it was an emergency. If it's not an emergency, then you can go and select. So you could have an emergency action plan that deals with an emergency and that deals where you actually you can contain the situation. It's not time critical. No one's going to get hurt. You just really need to wrap things up and contain them. And if, it's, if you say no and it gets worse, then you go back to treating it as if it was an emergency. So most cases, the answer is going to be because things can go wrong, you need to have a solid plan to deal with the emergency. Then we decide the next step is what action are we going to take? And that's the primary action, okay? If you don't get it right, it doesn't matter. We can fix that in a moment. But you'll decide for yourself, what's the first thing I'm going to do? And again, we can't foresee all your situations. So 
You can type in there whatever you think you're going to do first. Then to the left of that is a text block, and in that you do your what-if stuff. So step number one, step number two, you just type it all in there so that you can deal with the various variations, or it might be a sequence of events that you need to follow if something goes wrong. Emergency equipment, I did mention that to you before. We have two different drop-down boxes because often we need more than just one set of emergency equipment. And if, it's, if you need more than what's in here, then you'll need to go and add that to the text box. Next part are your emergency contacts. And 911 and Dan's hotline are not the only two numbers you want to have in your arsenal. So we try to populate that with as many things as we can think about. Again, there's another and other that you can put in there depending on what the situation is. And it depends where you are. If you're not out at sea, then you probably don't need the Coast Guard, right? But you will certainly need somebody that you can call for help, and I call that the operation center. Or 911 to call the fire brigade, the ambulance, the police, whoever else might be involved there. You might want to have the number there for your insurance company, because we know that if we've had issues where there could be a liability issue, we want to let them know and start finding the paperwork for that. And similarly, you might want to have your legal advisor's name there too. Now, this is a fillable PDF, but I have, it's not locked. So if you know how to edit a PDF file, you can go in there and change any of this text to what you want to do. Just be aware that Acrobat doesn't make the most user-friendly form-filling device. And when you start to fiddle with text, sometimes it... Anyway, you'll have the master, and you can go back and download the master and, and redo it all. Remember that the numbers change. Remember to test the numbers, to update them. Um, and you can decide how often you're going to do that. And if you operate in different locations, then you can have different numbers for those different locations. And if things change, you want to make sure that you revisit what numbers you're going to call. Hopefully at this stage of your emergency, you've got things under control. We call that emergencies resolved. Okay, nothing's gonna get worse, so we can actually call it a day there. And you then move it across to the yes, and you fill in the paperwork, and your job is pretty much done at this particular stage. But when things go wrong, they tend to go wrong big time, and so we need to have the next level of emergency that we're gonna deal with. So we thought everything was resolved, it wasn't resolved, what do we do next? And again, a series of drop-downs to prompt you what to think about. Again, an other box, I'm gonna keep pushing that because people forget that it's there, and they say to me, listen, on this drop-down, I don't find this particular type of emergency. Our field is too broad, and we've had too many different types of emergencies for us to define, but if you come up with something that you think of value to us, please drop me a line. I'm at risk mitigation at dan.org, and I will gladly update the list. That's how we do most of our work, is feedback from what happens in the industry. We're not an ivory tower. We don't sit there and write the rules. We have an emergency center. We learn many, many lessons from that. We learn lessons from incidents that are reported and go to research. And using all of this, we can actually improve what it is that we do. OK, again, you're going to select what's the first action, usually going to be evacuation. And then you've got a text box in there that you can fill in all the subsequent steps, or the plan B and the plan C if plan A doesn't work. But once it's under control, we now can take a breath, or that's when the jitters really set in, when the adrenaline stops firing. You want to make sure that you capture the information as quickly as you can, because as time goes past, we know that our recollection of that accident tends to diminish. And obviously secure the facility, especially if there's been serious injury or death. You know, the police are going to come in, so please lock off that area. Don't let people get into that area. And then afterwards, check whether your plan worked. I mean, I'm hoping you don't have to use the plan ever. But if, the, you know, if you do have an issue, make sure that your plan could cope with that. If you hear of issues that other people have had that you could have and you've got a plan, make sure you know, that your plan is going to take care of whatever that complication is. So we've got a bunch of prompts over there for you to tick off what you would do after a particular type of emergency. So it's things like filing the documentation, um, refilling your first aid kit and your O2 kit, making sure that the plan worked. If the plan didn't work, you probably want to go and revisit it and make some adjustments to that. OK, so I've gone pretty much from the top to the bottom of the, of the plan. And what I'd like to do now, and we've still got a bit of time, is actually take you through how we would do this. So I'm going to try my best to interact with this thing. Acrobat is not always one's best friend, but let's give it a try. The one thing it keeps doing, that anybody tell me how to hide this thing when you start? You're a better person than I am. 
Okay, so we get as much screen as we can. So that's really what the form looks like. It doesn't present very well um, on a screen like that. But let me go through a couple of the things now with you. So I've decided for an example to give you, I'm going to take, we have a cylinder rupture or a hose rupture in our workshop. So let's have a look. These are all the different types of things that can happen. And here we go. I have a cylinder that exploded. Or what we've had fairly recently is a filling whip that came apart. And I thought it was pretty rare until we had three cases in 12 months that we know about. I'm not talking about how many happen outside of uh, you know, in areas where we don't get to hear about it. So the first step is going to be, okay, is this a life-threatening event? And let's say no one got injured, and of course we got the fright of our lives. I won't say how we responded to that. But we probably go down there and say, hmm, the, probably the best thing to do is contain it, shut off the valve, shut everything down. Just to show you got quite cute up here, you can put in the date over there. So we populate the date field, and then you can put in the name of emergency action plan, whatever that's going to be. But unfortunately, it wasn't the case. The whip came out, the filling whip, and actually struck somebody across the chest. So now we need to be, and that was the only person in the workshop at the time. So what's our first action going to be in that particular case? Anybody want to give me a clue what you would think that you would do over there? Call for help? Find shut off the valve? Really depends on what you think is going to come first. It's not really that important. So let's say you decide to call for help. And then, of course, that's not the only thing you've got to do. So somebody's going to have to go in there and shut off the valves. And obviously, you can populate that with as many things that you can realistically think are the permutations and the combinations if you had a hose failure. They happen. They are deadly. They can not only injure, they can kill people. They've taken limbs off people. They've taken limbs off kids that have been walking past these wretched, long filling hoses. My pet hate is to see down at the Keys where they have a filling station in the dive shop, and then they have this 30-foot high-pressure filling hose lying across the, the jetty into the boat so they can fill the cylinders on the boat. And one of those came off, and a kid was walking past and amputated the kid's leg. You don't want to be that person because the fallout from that was pretty severe. Never mind the injury. So we're going to call for help, so we probably need communications equipment and... I don't want to second guess, but let's say we need to have a serious first aid kit if somebody's going to be injured there. Okay, now spare me from having to fill all these things in, but let's say you have a, you have a boat and you have an operation sent on board, and this is one of the emergency action plans that Dr. Nocetto and I went down to this particular liverboard operator, and they were complaining that Dan wasn't sending helicopters out to fetch the people when they were 36 hours away from shore. And what we did is we got them to put their plan together. We could intercede, we could help guide, we could organize things, but they needed to take the primary action. So the first thing they do there is, depends where they are, but let's say they, that's the telephone number or the call sign for the operation center. Most cases, we're gonna do 911 for these, right? Here in the, in the States, is really easy. Um, Coast Guard, you're gonna phone 911. Perhaps you might have another number for that. Police and so on, let me not go through everything with you there. So you can see that you can fill in all the different numbers. So if you have an emergency, that number's really on hand for you. Then if it's resolved itself, whoever's been injured, you can patch them up, get them off for extra assistance. But the situation is now under control. You've resolved it, hopefully. Just the fallout afterwards. But if it isn't resolved, if somebody's been catastrophically injured or injured beyond your ability to deal with them, then you're probably going to need to get them to advanced care. And in this case, you probably need to call an ambulance or call an EMS or whatever it happens to be, just to give you a couple of examples as to how we fill this in. Then you go in and check whatever documentation, practice the, the plan. Let me just get back to replenish the stock over there. And we have our plan. Now we're going to go through it, we're going to discuss it amongst ourselves. We're then going to go and practice it out in the field, make sure that it makes sense. But that's going to form the basis of your plan. Now before I show you what it looks like, I just want to show you a cute little feature up there, clear form. We're back to where we were. But I didn't take out the telephone numbers. Because I've learned with time that it's a real pain having to go back and fill in telephone numbers. So you can, you can modify them, but at least that part of your form stays now. This is the part that doesn't always work. There we go. So that's what the form looks like. In this particular case, I went through the various combinations and permutations. That's what it prints out like. I think it's pretty useful. I think it will give those of you that have, you know, kind of come to me and say, how do I put a plan together? <laughs> then I can give you something that you can then use to think through. And folks, sometimes the plan is way more complicated than this. So then you probably need to have a series of them. 
But this at least get, gets you thinking in the right direction of what are the things I will need to do, the numbers I need to collect, the different per permutations and possibilities, what sort of equipment do I use, and it'll force you to think through this thing logically and hopefully come out with something that's going to work for you. Okay, I'll give you a chance to ask questions in a moment. Let me just um, kind of get to the end of this. So, the best protection is being prepared. Having a good plan, working your way through it, perhaps adjusting your standard operating procedures, certainly reorientating your staff to what could go wrong. That way, it's highly unlikely something's going to go wrong. And if it does, it's usually going to be something completely out of your control. Okay. You know, remember, if things get out of your control, and you think, well, I didn't know about this wave that knocked the boat over, so I'm out of, off the hook. It's not the case. You still need to have a plan. You still need to follow your plan. If the plan didn't work, okay, things go completely wrong. But the fact that you didn't have a plan is not going to help you in terms of any legal case afterwards. And I'm sorry to keep harping on this legal stuff that happens afterwards, but that's usually what the reality is. We live through this ordeal. We live through knowing we've injured somebody or destroyed something. And then to cap it all, we've got this huge unknown thing that's going to come at us. Whether we are insured or not, it's not relevant. We're going to have to live through the consequences. And so what you'd want to be able to say to yourself, I did the best I could do. I was planned. I was prepared. I followed my plan. Okay, it got outside of my control. But at least I didn't panic, throw my hands in the air, and just jump overboard and let the rest of the people below decks fend for themselves. So, just some final words. Do your homework. Think this thing carefully through. Please don't cut and paste emergency action plans from other people. You can take it by all means and see what they were dealing with, but you need to think through your situation for yourself very, very carefully. Accidents don't follow the same pattern. You might not have the same competence staff. The situation might be different. So you want your plan to be unique to your dive operation. What's the only thing we learn from history? We don't learn from history, right? <laughs> so we have these things happen over and over again, and you think that we would, you know, it, it happens. We all get shocked and horrified. A year later, that fear has diminished, and two years later, we've moved on to the next issue. Be realistic. Don't think that your plan is going to be able to cover everything. And if you don't have a trained firefighter, I mean, this is a very specialized area of emergency service. Do the best you can, but if the fire gets out of your control, you evacuate the building, you get everybody to a muster point, you have a means of communicating, and you don't go back in the building to fetch your laptop. That happened, right? She went down below deck to fetch her laptop and never came out again. And then just don't take safety for granted. Don't let this complacency take over and allow you to forget and not take these things seriously. So, I've seen some heads nodding over here. I think some folks have dealt with some of these things before. The form is freely downloadable on our website. If you do have feedback, if there are things that you don't agree with, feel free to take it on with me. If you've got things you want to add, please tell me. I can adjust it for you if you need it to be adjusted for you, or you can do that yourselves. But really, as Dr. Sariva said, people call Dan and they say, this has happened, and we say to them, okay, so what's your plan? <laughs> and then they say, no, you're our plan. Wrong. Afterwards they say, okay, I've got it. What's the best plan? Can you send me a copy of an emergency action plan? And I can't do that, but I can certainly engage with you on the phone, or the medics will engage with you on the phone to say, okay, let's think this thing through. Who are the emergency service providers? What equipment do you have on board? What training do you have? What communications equipment do you have? And together, we can put a, a really, you know, a plan in place that will deal with most of the things that could happen when you're out to sea or out on your dive site, or filling cylinders, or treating chemical, you know, dealing with the chemicals to treat your pools. Yes, sir. Okay, so you go to dan.org, you go to safety services, then you select dive operators, dive operations, I should say. And then go down to resources. And you'll see a whole long list of resources, emergency action plans, tools. There must be about 50 documents that we've uploaded there, articles you can read, you know, really trying to give you the benefit of what we've learned over time that you can put into your operation.
So we see a lot of emerging Yes. It, it would, yeah. I really like this. Yeah. Absolutely. That's it's designed for dive operators, businesses, dive professionals, dive masters, rescue divers, everybody. So it's got all, and I would, I would really recommend you use that as a resource for them. They might come up with other things, but it'll force them to say, I didn't realize these things could go wrong. You know, I kind of just think of DCS or Lost Diver, and this will take you, you know, down a much longer path. Biggest issue is health-related issues. And we're not really equipped to deal with the guy with hypertension. We might have a great indemnity form, but that doesn't help us deal with the situation when it happens. Anything else? Okay, I'm gonna be outside if you want to ask any more questions. I just want to hand over to who's next. Oh, we've got an hour for lunch. Okay, well, I'm here.